recovering hope, rebirth. This is what we were offered as we believe in Jesus Christ. We explored last week the first step, a general step in the 12-step recovery program, that we need to recognize that on our own, by ourselves, it's not working. We need God. This week, we explore the second general step of recovery programs. We believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. We need God. In the Pasco Republican Herald, quite recently, there was a story printed on the main page, the first page, of a mother from Minersville who had lost her son to an opioid overdose. And yet she asked that the county coroner would add not only opioids to the cause of his death, but also COVID-19. For her son had been in recovery. He was doing well with his program, living in a group home that gave him the support he needed. He had regular employment to keep him busy. But when COVID-19 hit, the program shut down, he lost his job, and returned to his old home where there were temptations of his past that returned to haunt him. And so he became another victim to our quarantine, to our crisis of the moment. And his story is not unusual. As you read the news throughout the country, you'll see that in fact, overdose uh, deaths have increased as people have been without the resources they need to help them to survive without the support and community that they need. And this day, Wednesday, June 17th, we're still facing a rising number of cases of COVID, now over 2 million in this country, with uh, 680,000 recovered and net fatalities, nearing 119,000. I wonder how many of those should have, be added to the list, those who've been victims of overdose because they've not had the support they needed during our crisis. This time of quarantine has worn heavily on all of us, and many of us would admit that the best of ourselves have not come out, that we found ourselves turning to bad behaviors during this time as coping mechanisms. All is not well in the world, and in many ways that means all is not well in our lives. Addiction quite simply is becoming enslaved to something that is outside of ourselves, something that becomes a habit or a practice that we become dependent upon physically or psychologically, something other than God. Now, most of us will be able to say, no, I'm not an addict. No, I might, may have a few bad habits, but that's the word you can say, they don't control me. Yet as I continue to study over the summer what addiction is all about, I have to admit that I really like peanut M&Ms and usually have them around. Addiction to sugar? And of course, I spend a lot of time on the keyboard at church, and sometimes I begin to explore things on the internet and find myself going down a rabbit hole instead of pursuing my work. Internet addiction? And at home, I tend to spend a lot of time in front of the television and then wonder the next morning why I'm so tired. TV addiction? Perhaps I'm not as healthy as I think I am. And those are just the things I'm willing to admit to you publicly realize. The American Society of Addiction Medicine, known as ASAM, has defined addiction as a primary chronic disease of brain reward, motivation, memory, and related circuitry. They have found five characteristics which they think are telling of addiction. First, abstain. There's the inability to abstain consistently from this bad behavior. There's behavior control, uh, an impairment of behavioral control. There's craving, a uh, hunger for the drugs or rewarding uh, whatever the behavioral experience might be. There's D, diminished recognition of significant problems which develop because of my behavior or my addiction in terms of my relationship with other people. And finally, E, emotional. Emotions, when we're in, caught up in addiction and, and bad behavior patterns, become dysfunctional. They're, they're not based on reality, but when on the reality our brain has created the addiction within our minds. 
And so there's a cycle that falls into place. There's an emotional trigger that causes to seek the addiction to crave it, to participate in that ritual, whether it's you know, a, a abuse of a substance or behavioral issues. And once we've used them, we feel guilty, which triggers our emotional response and the cycle continues. So again, our addiction may be substance abuse, and that's pretty easy to figure out, to point out, whether it's tobacco, alcohol, drugs of some kind, uh, prescription medication, as well as illegal drugs. And then there are behavioral addictions. These are prevalent in our society, addictions to social media, to overspending, to uh, working excessively, uh, addictions to sex, and relationships, gambling, food addiction, certainly prevalent in our society, as well as codependency. And then increasingly, there's our addiction to online resources, whether we're talking about social media, that's uh, television, internet, video games, cell phones, pornography is really seeping into our culture as an addiction because of internet use. So I think we, if we're being honest with ourselves, we'd have to say, yes, if I'm not an addict, at least I certainly show strong tendencies toward addictive behavior. And so I need help. I need to turn to someone. If I find myself being hostile or ashamed, if I reject any criticism of my behavior, if I'm preoccupied with rewarding myself with the behavior I know isn't good for me, if I want to change but I can't, all of these indicate I have a problem. And if my final question to myself is, <clears throat> am I willing to stop right now and everything within me cries, no. I need to recognize I have a problem. But there is hope, always and forever, for God is with us. God is the one who gives us strength for today and hope for tomorrow. God has sent Jesus Christ into the world so that we know God is a God of forgiveness, a God of goodness and grace, a God of second chances. In God, we find that we have the ability to begin to overcome these addictions and behavioral issues, to uninstall them, so to say, so they're not imprinted in our mind. Is it easy? No. But is it possible with God's help and the support of one another? Yes. James Taylor is a testament to this. Throughout his life, he's been addicted to heroin, methadone, painkillers, tobacco, alcohol. Sort of covered the gamut. And yet, through his music, which offered him a source of healing, and through an increasing sense of spiritual dependence, James was able to overcome his issues. But still, there were times early on in his career when those around him wondered if he would become just one more name, just one more rock star who had fallen to heroin, who had died of an overdose. And so they staged interventions in his life. He himself often would give up heroin, cold turkey, and be successful at it for some time, but then stumble again. When he married Carly Simon and he realized that his addiction was interfering with their relationship, he once promised her that he would choose her over the drug. And so in their hotel room, he shot up before her one last time. And then he took all of his drugs and flushed them down the toilet, burning all of the equipment in the incinerator of the hotel, telling her he was done, that she was his choice. And yet not two years later, when their daughter Sarah was born in January of 1974, James once again took the vow that he would quit heroin, that he would no longer be an addict. These addictions have strong holds over us. And to say it can't happen to me is a lie to ourselves and to God. And yet, we can break out of this prison if we confess to ourselves and to those in our life if we confess to God, God will be with us. We can't do it our, on our own, but with God's help, we can. We need to let God work within us so that we can admit those areas of our lives that need to change and seek that change with God's help, confessing to others and asking for their forgiveness. Each day, we evaluating how we are living our lives. Are we successfully following in the path of Jesus Christ? 
Are we salt and light? And then praying and meditating so that what we have received in the terms of grace and forgiveness, we may give away to others. We admit we are powerless, but that God can restore us. This is because we are God's people. We belong to God who has created us, who claims us, who will not give up on us, even if we are tempted to give up on ourselves. For we belong to God, all that we are, body, mind, and spirit, created in the image of God, created to be people of God. So as the Israelites listened to Peter's sermon and heard that Jesus had been killed for the wrong reasons, that Jesus was sent by God to reveal God, that Jesus was God's chosen and anointed Messiah, they asked, what do we do? This may be our question as well as we cope with our problems. What do we do? Peter's response was to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, to receive freedom from sins and new life in Christ, to be buried as Christ had been buried following his death, to be buried to sin, that we might rise and walk in the newness of life following Jesus Christ. We do this in the context of the Christian community, which supports us, our church family, which is there to encourage us to go on as we take on new tasks and try things that are new, leaving behind the past. And in doing so in the Christian community, as we come together, as we pray, as we worship, as we eat and drink in the name of Jesus Christ, we have a foretaste of that heavenly banquet where we will be once and for all free from our sins to live with God. But some, realizing that sin was a way of manifesting God's grace in the early Christian community, thought perhaps they should sin more and sin boldly and frequently, and that meant God's grace would abound and be more abundant. Paul answers that with a strong and solid no. We are not to continue in sin so that grace may abound, there is always enough of God's grace for us and for our needs. Instead, we are to leave sin behind, to live behind those addictions and behaviors which are bad for us and which have a negative impact on our relationship with others. We are buried by baptism in Christ to sin and death that we might be raised to new life in Christ. Baptized once by water and yet baptized throughout our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit, which cleanses us with a holy fire and makes us clean, reminding us that God's grace and righteousness make us right. It is not something we do on our own. Jesus calls us to be the salt of the earth, to give flavor to life as we interact with others, to be the light of the world, reflecting the light of God that shines through us. And as this light shines in us before others, it is to shine so that others may see the light in order to do, to, in order to um, offer glory to God. It's not so that others will see our good works and praise us, but rather praise God, seeing all that God has done through us. James used the words, shed a little light. Jesus said, be light. As we shine in the world, we reflect God's goodness. And so we want to stand in that goodness, walk in that goodness. It's not something we're going to get from money or from television or from any other source outside of God. It's not something we're going to get through addiction, whether it's to a substance or a behavior or some inanimate object. What we want to see when we open our eyes is the glory of God before us, drinking from the well of life so that our children will also have that hope, that possibility that they will see the light and walk in the light, sharing with one another what it means to be a community of God's people. God's love was shown to us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And so now that we have been baptized in Christ, we are dead to sin and alive in Christ. We have hope. Even as we face the problems in our lives, even as we see ourselves clearly and honestly, even as we confess to one another 
that we are not always people who walk in light and not always people who taste like the goodness of salt. Even so, there is hope. Darkness cannot overcome that hope. For through Jesus Christ and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have been invited to walk in the newness of life, that in all that we do, we may see God at work in our lives. We may see the hope and promise God offers to us through the Holy Spirit. And we, in turn, may give glory to God at all times and in all ways. Thanks be to God. And now would you join with me to affirm our faith through the words of the Serenity Prayer, written long ago by the Reverend Reinhold Niebuhr, adapted for our purposes. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it. Trusting that you will make all things right if I surrender to your will, so that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. And now we join with Chris to sing, Mighty to Save, for God's goodness is mighty and saves us everything. 